to first formally formally introduce the speaker um so hi everyone uh, welcome to today's session of the schrodinger's kittens researchers talk where we have talks by researchers working in different fields of physics today we have a very special guest with us uh, professor subir uh, sajde from harvard university who has been kind enough to accept our invitation before we start i would like to introduce our esteemed speaker professor sajdev is one of the world's leading theoretical physicists uh, specializing in condensed matter physics professor sajdev completed his phd in theoretical physics from harvard university and then held professional positions at bell bell labs and yale university before returning to harvard where he is herschel smith professor in physics he has held uh, he has held visiting positions at prestigious institutes like perimeter institute of theoretical physics and tifa mumbai he has also been on the physical sciences jury for the infosys award from 2018 professor sajdev is widely recognized for his significant uh, contributions to the description of various types of entangled states of quantum matter and his work uh, and also his work on the theory of quantum phase transitions his outstanding achievements in the field of physics have earned him numerous prestigious awards including the lars onsager prize from the american physical society and the dirac medal from the international center for theoretical physics in 2014 he was elected to the us national academy of sciences for his exceptional contributions to the physics research uh, we are honored to have him here today to deliver a lecture on when nature entangles millions of particles from quantum materials to black holes we look forward to learning from his valuable insights and expertise please join me in welcoming professor subir sachdev over to you sir okay thank thank you very much kartikeya uh, thank you for the invitation <laughs> pleasure to be here uh, what happened um can you see my what's an old funny can you see my screen now uh yeah we can see okay i don't know why not seeing the green line okay anyway okay so now everything looks good yeah yeah you see my main slide and the arrow yeah all right great try scrolling okay uh... um yeah okay no let me i think it'll work um uh, oops okay so 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 thank you very much and uh, pleasure to be here and uh So thanks for your interest and I'm I'm going to keep this fairly informal and I'm happy to entertain questions maybe you can raise your hand or just speak up if I don't notice your hand and I'll pause a few times uh, uh for the questions. Okay so this is I prepared this as a fairly basic talk so let me well although it will get complicated pretty soon uh let me just remind you uh what is entropy and temperature So the original definition of entropy going back to Clausius in uh, 1865 um is that some quantity you define using thermodynamics uh using some complicated procedure with heat flow uh, and is defined so that every macroscopic system has an entropy which cannot decrease has to increase and there can't be any uh perpetual motion machines uh and temperature was defined in sort of an arbitrary way um as just the uh, you know the height of some piece of mercury with some markings and gives you some scale uh but a more precise definition and the one we use today came from uh, boltzmann uh which is he related entropy to uh to statistics so if you have a thermodynamic system with many many degrees of freedom uh it's characterized by some simple quantities like pressure and volume and uh total energy and things like that but those macroscopic variables are consistent with uh many microscopic degrees of freedom uh and so w is somehow the volume or the measure of the how many degrees of freedom are compatible with the macroscopic observations and that gives you the entropy uh by this famous formula that's in the gravestone of uh, boltzmann uh, in 1870 so kb is a constant if it was bob to boltzmann would have been just one uh, it's just a constant that's inserted to make this definition consistent with clausius's definition so i'm going to just set kb equals to one 
Uh, also, another remarkable thing about Boltzmann definition, uh, it becomes, in fact, easier to apply uh, in quantum mechanics. So in 1870, of course, there wasn't any quantum mechanics. Uh, but in quantum mechanics, as you know, every quantum system has a discrete set of allowed uh, uh, states of energy. So we can define a density of uh, uh, quantum states, how many energy how many states, allowed states that are there are in a given interval. Uh, and then the entropy is just the log of the density of states. Okay. All right. So, and then of course, the, there's temperature, which is defined as how entropy inc increases as a function of uh, energy. So this is the absolute scale of temperature, which I'm going to assume from now on. Okay, so that's uh, thermodynamics 101. Uh, let me now just remind you quantum mechanics 101, in particular, what is uh, quantum entanglement? Um, so the idea of quantum entanglement really arose from this paper in 1935 by Einstein, Budolsky, and Rosen, uh, who uh, you know, basically speculated that there was something wrong with quantum mechanics, and, uh, at least at a philosophical level, uh, because it seem to imply some rather strange behavior. Uh, and and this strange behavior came from applying more carefully something that had been accepted in uh, quantum theory so far, which is the principle of superposition, that a physical system can be in a superposition of uh, two more distinct states, um, like the electron going through the left slit or the right slit in the famous uh, double slit experiment. But what EPR said, well, let's consider a thought experiment where there are two electrons. And imagine these two electrons are in this kind of state uh, that, roughly speaking, is found in a hydrogen molecule. Uh, I, I represent each electron by its spin, which can be either up or down. Uh, and the state of the electrons in a hydrogen molecule is this superposition state of two distinct configurations. In one of them, the left electron has spin up and the other one has spin down. And in the other one, uh, it's vice versa. All right, so this is the state that people had understood existed in a hydrogen molecule. Um, and there was no real controversy about that. But what EPR suggested is that, well, suppose you were able to separate these two spins without, uh, yeah, separate the two electrons without disturbing the spin. So then even though they're very far apart with one electron here and the other electron you know, on the moon in principle, uh, they are still entangled and still in this state where uh, they're neither up nor down. So, oops, that should have flipped the spin, but it didn't. There's a, something wrong with my graphics there. Uh, anyway, uh, so given this entanglement, which can then exist over long ranges, uh, then EPR pointed out that there's a seeming, uh, at least, uh, unpleasant feature, uh, which is that we know that you know when you measure some the, this the state of a quantum system is only fully determined when you actually look at it. So in this case, if I look at the left electron, uh, it collapses as we say say to the spin up. So if I see spin up, then the other electron, even though it's very far away. Would that or that that instant uh, be spin down or vice versa? Sorry, I have I have this messed up these pictures that should flip to down. Excuse me. Uh, anyway, okay. So the measurement one electron seems to instantly determine the state of the other electron far away. Uh, of course, uh, we know today that uh, well. Oh, sorry. And this is what it is said that Einstein calls spooky action at a distance. Uh, I was very uh, suspicious about this. Did he actually say this? Uh, in fact, he did. So this was in a letter by Albert Einstein to Max Born. Uh, this is the original letter in German. Uh, that's spooky action at a distance in German. Uh, so they tell me. Uh, and as he says, I cannot seriously believe in it, meaning quantum mechanics, because the theory cannot be reconciled with the idea that Physics should reference a reality in time and space free from spooky action at a distance. Uh, so, so is this really a problem? 
Well, it can't really be a problem because the experiment, which was purely a thought experiment, uh, has been done now many, many times over. Uh, here, was, here was a report in the New York Times. It was done with photons, not with electrons, but uh, the basic underlying experiment is essentially what they have proposed. So, so you know, how does one reconcile this? Uh, how do you, why are you getting this spooky action under distance? Uh, but re really, uh, you know, what one has to accept is that the concept of a quantum state is not a local concept. Uh, the two electrons, you know, were close to each other way back in the past, and that's when they affected each other. But once they formed a quantum state, the quantum state didn't belong to one or the other electron. It was really in neither place. And so the quantum state can be highly non-local, but measurements and all physical influences and causality is completely local. Okay, that's our understanding today. Okay, so now, so with that introduction to quantum mechanics 101 and thermodynamics 101, uh, let me move on to the topics I have mentioned in my uh, in my title. So, uh, and amazingly, the two concepts of entropy and and quantum entanglement actually come together in a remarkable way when we think about black holes. Um, so what are black holes? Well, black holes were originally discovered as solutions to Einstein's theory of gravity, general relativity. Um, and this was a solution discovered by Schwarzschild, where he imagined taking some mass M and really compressing it to a very small distance smaller than this, what's called R. And then it turns out that the mass is so dense uh, that light itself is gravitationally bound and nothing can escape from inside what's called the horizon. So uh, no information, no light, nothing can ever get out from inside the black hole to the outside of the black hole uh, in Einstein's theory of gravity. Uh, but this is, of course, you know, extremely dense you know, for the Earth's mass m, uh, where g is Newton's constant and c is the velocity of light. Uh, this becomes around uh, nine millimeters. So that's a, a very, very dense object. Uh, but such objects we now today exist. There's a, such an object at the center of every galaxy, including our own. And the one in our galaxy has a solar mass of about has a mass of about 4.3 million solar masses and a radius of about the size of the Earth's orbit uh, around the sun. Um, and this supermassive black hole is constantly eating up stars and growing. Uh, and, okay. And now, you know, has been seen, uh, uh, well, no, it, it hasn't been directly seen, it's been seen indirectly due to the motion of stars nearby. Okay, so, so there's, uh, now we turn to the sort of philosophical question in a way, but really physically important, uh, what is inside a black hole? Now, actually I lied a little bit. I said the matter was very dense. In fact, it's even more dense than I said, uh, because if you take Einstein's equation uh, for the uh, gravitating matter, uh, the matter continues to attract itself until it collapses uh, to a singularity at the center. So there's, Einstein's equation would say that there's actually infinitely dense matter at the center of a black hole, uh, uh, which is why no one really believed these solutions were realistic uh, when they were first discovered for really quite a long time, for 30, 40 years before people started taking them seriously. Um, yeah, so a singularity convinced many that black holes were unphysical solution of Einstein's equation and did not exist in our universe. Uh, and it's also clear that even if they did, once matter got so dense, you couldn't treat it with Einstein's equations. There's a quantum theory which describes the microscopic world. Uh, and we know we have to apply this to the collapsed matter. Uh, but even with all the fancy developments in quantum mechanics, no one really knew how to combine it with gravity. Uh, and describe uh, what's going on in the center of a black hole. Okay, so the first clue, or the, you know, the big breakthrough really 
uh, which started revealing more and more of what's inside a black hole, uh, came from the work of Hawking. Uh, and we can uh, we can you know rephrase Hawking's uh, arguments in, in the following way. Uh, let's take our uh, let's take our uh, uh, EPR pair and separate the two uh, the two electrons again in a thought experiment for now, uh, so that one is inside a black hole and the other is outside. Now there's nothing you know nothing dramatic that or in fact that can happen in the black hole horizon in Einstein's equations. It's just like locally, just like any other part of space-time. It's got this strong gravitational fields, but there's nothing special. Um, you know, if you're right inside the horizon or right outside the horizon, you won't feel a thing. It's the same. Uh, so you expect the entanglement to still persist, uh, even when one electron is inside the horizon, inside the black hole, and the other is outside. Um, so they're still entangled. And if so, now I got the arrows correct. <laughs> when this is down, the other is up, or vice versa. That's still the case. Um, okay. But so that means there's quantum entanglement with the inside and outside of a black hole. Okay. Can't, you know, that seems really unes unescapable by just combining Einstein's theory of gravity with what we know about quantum mechanics. Um, okay. So, and from this, Hawking argued that black holes have a temperature and an entropy. And what is the argument? Well, imagine you're the outside observer here with this electron in your hand, then uh, the state of the electron inside the black hole can never be known. You know, it's just gone forever. No one can measure it and send you a signal. Uh, it's just inside. So since you, you know, you can't know that if you're doing a quantum theory of your visible universe, you have some set of equations uh, they will all describe the region outside the black hole. And as since, and in that region, there is no entangled partner. So this electron is, you know, is up and down. Those are the two possible state of the electron, but they're both completely random. It's not due to, it's not entangled with anything else that you can see or measure for the foreseeable future. Uh, and therefore, there's some randomness, and as you've learned from from Boltzmann, that implies entropy and also a temperature. So that was uh, Hawking's celebrated result. Uh, he's uh, imagine an observer outside a black hole, and just by thinking about what's uh, quantum theory of that observer, uh, you conclude uh, that there's an entropy. Uh, of course, Hawking did more than that. He actually got a number. Uh, this is Hawking's entropy uh, for a black hole expressed in terms of the velocity of light uh, and Newton's constant. And A is the area of this horizon. So that's really in some ways also, you know, a very remarkable feature, but you can sort of understand it, why there's proportion of the area, because as I've said, the, uh, the, entangle, the entropy is entirely due to entanglement of degrees of freedom across the horizon. So and you would expect the number of degrees of freedom to be proportional in this case to the surface area. Uh, but it's very, very different from any other system, which is not a black hole, uh, you know, where uh, you have an entropy proportional to the volume, just like you know, the gas or a cup of coffee, the entropy is always proportional to volume. So that's uh, one shocking thing. The other shocking thing, of course, is that uh, and this is really the first formula that we know that involves Newton's constant and Planck's constant together. All right, and this is a, turns out a very large entropy. Um, okay, all right, so, so that was Hawking's result in 1975. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's puzzled physicists ever since. So, okay, but this raises some questions in particular, you know, Boltzmann has taught us, if you go back to the very, you know, first slide I showed you, uh, Boltzmann has taught us uh, that entropy is the logarithm of the density of quantum states. So if the entropy is large, there's really many, many quantum states. 
uh, and and so there must be many many quantum degrees of freedom. But Hawking's calculation doesn't tell you what they are at all. Hawking's calculation is a very general type of calculation which only works with gravity, it works with Einstein's equations, uh, and just looks at uh, you know some basic properties of the role of h bar in it. Uh, but it doesn't tell you, you know, you've got this entropy, you know, what is this entropy of? Where are these microscopic degrees of freedom? You just have a featureless black hole as far as you know, looking from the outside. I mean, you expect there are some sort of entangled pairs in the physical picture, but where, what are these? And uh, why don't you need to know more about that to compute the entropy? Okay, so for this, you really need a complete theory for the of quantum theory of the inside of a black hole, which, you know, which we don't really have, although we are getting a lot of hints from many directions. Uh, and in fact, the first uh, very important hint came from uh, string theory. So string theory was able to find certain solutions uh, of black holes. It's a full quantum theory, which has black hole states. Uh, but this is only for the case where the black holes had some extra symmetry called supersymmetry, which is not present at low energies in our universe. Uh, anyway, so with a supersymmetric and also a black hole with net charge, uh, Stromer and Walfa were able to compute, uh, you know, compute the density of states uh, for a certain black hole for which you know, they also knew the area. And, and remarkably, they found exactly the correspondence you expected from Boltzmann. So that was a real triumph. Uh, but there was a, a sort of an, another bizarre feature of their result, which is these this density of states, uh, all the states that made up the black hole had exactly the same energy. Uh, there was a delta function at zero energy in this case, that's the ground state. Uh, and this was the degeneracy of the of the uh, of the state at zero energy so that and and it was clear that the, this degeneracy was really a consequence of the supersymmetry and that's how they were able to compute it they really use supersymmetry in the whole calculation okay so so this okay that's important a uh, step but it doesn't answer the question what would happen for a more realistic black hole which didn't have supersymmetry all right, so now I've uh, introduced, you know, a major problem in physics and that's been around for a while. Uh, I'll give you some latest developments in a while, uh, but the developments came, you know, I, I'm not a black hole physicist, but some of my work has now helped answer this question. Uh, I came on it from very, very different motivations, but, but where some of the issues you're facing had, had some connection to this. So my own interests are really in quantum condensed matter physics or quantum matter. And in particular, I've been interested for the longest time on what's called a strange metal. And I'll describe that a little bit. Uh, and so far, the common feature between the two, between black holes and strange metal is that they both, uh, as we'll see, involve entanglement. Entanglement, not just of one or two particles, but really entanglement of essentially an infinite number of particles. Particles. Okay, so what is a strange metal? But before I tell you what's a strange metal, let me tell you uh, ordinary metal like copper. Well, what's ordinary about it is that you can describe it by assuming the electrons are largely independent of each other. Uh, and you write down some theory for the electron distribution function and from which you can compute uh, essentially all observable properties. Uh, by applying quantum mechanics to each electron one at a time. Uh, however, in a strange metal, that's not possible. And the most famous strange metal uh, appears in, uh, for example, this compound uh, called yttrium barium copper oxide, uh, which is a, a high temperature superconductor. So here's a video of it. You would take a bit of this a little bit of YBCO and put it in, uh, in liquid nitrogen, uh, then uh, it'll float over magnets like that. Uh, and that's because it's superconducting at a temperature, uh, at liquid nitrogen temperature. Uh, 
Um, so after a while, it heats up, and then it's no longer superconducting, and it's not able to uh, repel, you know, expel the magnetic field, which is why it's floating when it's superconducting. So here's, uh, and these superconductors are very, very useful for carrying large amounts of current and creating strong magnetic fields. Uh, and in fact, there's a big effort now, uh, in particular, this company called Commonwealth Fusion System to use YBCO, this is tapes of YBCO here, uh, to create uh, very high magnetic fields in the center uh, and use that to confine a plasma for, for plasma fusion. Okay. That's just to, you know, to convince you that working on this YBCO is not a total waste of time. It's really, it potentially could have a huge impact. Okay, so here's a, a, a phase diagram as a function of what's called hole doping. And this is basically a measure of the concentration of electrons, which is varied by changing the concentration of oxygen in the crystal. And here we're looking at the electrons on a single uh, layer here, which is made up of copper atoms. So we're just going to think of this uh, crystal as uh, stacked square lattices of copper atoms. Uh, and we're counting the density on each layer. That's what this is. It's, so 0 0.1 means that uh, 10, there's one electron, uh, dope one electron in 10% of these copper atoms. Okay, so there's a certain range of doping uh, where it's a high temperature superconductor. Uh, but, uh, but what happens above uh, this, critic, uh, this TC of superconductivity? But at high doping, you have an ordinary metal, which is not so different from uh, copper. Uh, but in the most interesting regime, where you have the highest temperature superconductivity, uh, you get a strange metal. All right, so I... Uh, can't describe all the, you know, this has been studied for now 20, 30 years in great detail, and essentially all of its properties are strange. Uh, but the most famous one is just the, how its resistivity varies with the temperature. Uh, and it turns out to be a very linear function of temperature. Uh, uh, unlike in copper, where this would be quadratic. And, and, and this jump here is the onset of superconductivity in this particular material, which is lanthium strontium copper oxide. Okay, so that's the strange metal. Uh, and we need a theory of the strange metal, uh, which, you know, we've been working on, and my group has been working on for quite a while, and we have some interesting proposals that I'm fairly excited about uh, fairly recently. Uh, but to tell you something about what goes into this trace metal, let's actually begin by this uh, near that, the P equals zero limit where we have what's called an antiferromagnetic insulator. So in this regime, we know, understand pretty well what the electrons are doing. Uh, basically, you take the square lattice of copper atoms, the orange dots, and what the electrons are doing uh, is forming an antiferromagnet in which the spins on, say, the black squares of a chessboard are down, and the spins on the white squares of the chessboard are up. Uh, and that is literally what they do when you're in, in this red region over here. You can measure it by neutron scattering. Uh, so this is not an entangled state. This is a correlated state. Uh, if the spin is down, that's up. Uh, but it's, each spin is frozen in a given configuration, so there's no entanglement. Uh, and uh, and this is a state we ex understand extremely well. Okay, so now we want to start from this well understood state at p equals zero, uh, and move on to to the strange metal, and hopefully also to understand high temperature superconductivity. And this intermediate pink region is sometimes called the pseudo gap. I I won't go into it, uh, but the basic ingredient of the pseudo gap is what we call a spin liquid. So, so let me describe what is a spin liquid, and that's pretty much all I'm going to say about this problem of high temperature superconductivity. Okay, so what is a spin liquid? Well, spin liquid, as you know, uh, well, as I'll show you, involves entanglement. Okay. Uh, and in fact, a baby version of a spin liquid appeared already in 1865, even again, well before 
uh, quantum mechanics was discovered. Uh, and this was Kekulé's proposal for, uh, for the structure of the benzene molecule. So the benzene molecule has six carbon atoms. Uh, and if I just focus on the last electron, uh, which forms the double bond, if you, if you know a little bit about chemistry, uh, then that double bond can be represented by this ellipse. And that's basically this, our favorite EPR entangled pair of two electrons. Okay, but so Gemmes in 1865 knew about single and double bonds. Uh, but, you know, benzene seemed to be a perfect hexagon. And, and if this was the configuration of the double bonds, uh, then it won't be a perfect hexagon. It would distort. Uh, but there's another configuration, of course, where the bonds are exchanged, but then these would be the shorter bonds and those would be the longer bonds. This would also distort. And Kekulé asserted, uh, as a result of his daydream about snakes, uh, that in fact it's both, and so today we would say he had a, a wave. He was describing the entanglement of six electrons. It's really both of these, uh, and that's why benzene is a perfect hexagon because of the entanglement of these six electrons. Okay, uh, so now we so that now we learned a little bit about how to entangle six electrons, but now let's can we do the same for these uh, for these electrons in uh, in uh, in YBCO, or yeah, so these now in form an antiferromagnet, but now let's imagine they don't like to be in this antiferromagnetic state. They want to entangle with each other. So how can you entangle these electrons? Well, following Kekulé, uh, you just take pairs of electrons and have them form a bond. So up this each ellipse represents this configuration. But now, unlike in benzene, where there were only two configurations that seem natural. Here, there's really an infinite number for every possible dimer packing of the lattice. Uh, and so we are really entangling an infinite number of electrons. <laughs> uh, and this and the actual state of the system is neither one of, not one of these states, but really all of them. It's a superposition, entangled superposition of an infinite number of electrons. And that's really a new kind of state uh, was proposed by Phil Anderson, actually following some proposals by Law by by Linus Pauling in the 1947 or something, uh, that you could have the state which we, we now say today has long range entanglement, uh, not just six of them around the ring, but really everywhere. Uh, and this is a state that could potentially form. And there's a lot of evidence that such a state is indeed present in, in the pseudo gap. Now the pseudo gap, however. Uh, appears at finite doping, and doping corresponds to removing some electrons because they're doping with holes, so these are the empty states. And so now the pseudo gap is really, crudely speaking, you know, these holes can move around. It's the state where you have, you have these uh, entangled pairs and then they're entangled with each other and the holes are moving. And so that's rather a complicated state uh, that a lot of people have been working on, including us. and but I won't say more other than these crude pictures on what the structure of entanglement in that state is. Uh, and finally, what we believe is that when these, uh, these holes start to pair with each other and then also entangle with the rest of the electrons, that's how, that's how you get superconductivity and in particular superconductivity at relatively high temperatures. Okay. All right, so 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 that's my summary of uh, basic properties of the cuprates, at least some idea of some crude picture of the wave functions, uh, which like black holes involve entanglement, many, many EPR pairs. That's basically the common feature. Uh, but you know, none of this has really led to any theory of, for example, the strange metal, where you have a resistance that's linear in temperature. Uh, Okay, maybe I should have paused also a little earlier. So this is a good point to pause if there are any questions, uh, either on black holes or on high TC superconductor. Uh, you know, I've introduced these two physically distinct systems and just told you about some major problems that exist in understanding them. Mm, people okay. can put the questions yeah. in the chat box if there are any questions. Yeah, yeah. okay. 
All right. So, so we need a theory of the you know the black holes and how they get their entropy, and we need a theory um, of uh, the strange metal. Um, and so, really, what we need is a better understanding. Um, uh, and in particular, what would be really great to have some model that we can fully solve and really work out all the properties, uh, which involves entanglement, not just of two particles as EPR, but really an infinite number of particles, uh, you know, or six particles as in Kekulé, something that generalizes to a large number of particles. Uh, and that's what's called the SYK model. Uh, I mean, it's not the only model of many particle entanglement, but it's a model that actually seems to capture the essence of the entanglement in black holes and also uh, in strange metals. So what is it? Well, uh, you you know, Kekule said he had a dream about snakes. So I can also falsely claim that I had a, a dream about snakes. Uh, but this was a dream about snakes that could go from anywhere to anywhere uh, in sort of a random way, as they seem to go uh, in this game of snakes and ladders. Uh, so here's <laughs> then, uh, jokes aside, the actual SYK model. So you imagine you have a, a bunch of sites here, one through 19, um, and some fraction of those sites are occupied by electrons uh, represented by the purple circles. Here I'm not talking, I'm going to entangle these electrons, I'm going to entangle their positions, uh, not their spins. So I haven't drawn any spins uh, for each electron. So this is one possible state of the electrons with, uh, in this picture. Uh, but now quantum mechanically, the electrons are going to want to move around. Uh, and so, for example, the electrons are going to tunnel from side 11 and 12 to 5 and 14. So for this process, there's a certain uh, complex number that quantum mechanics associates to it. So that the square of the complex number, the probability that this tunneling event will happen. And so that number I'm going to call U11, 12, 5, 14 uh, by the labels of the sites involved. Okay, so you're given this number for, for this particular process, tunneling event. But there can be many other tunneling events, for example, from 5, 4 to 11, 18, and that has another number, and so on. So really, to, to specify the full dynamics of the system and to compute the future history of the system, uh, the future time evolution of the system, I need to give you a set of numbers and the initial state, of course. Uh, and th there's a, you know one number for e each such uh, correlated hopping. So I should say that the simplest hopping would be a one electron hopping, say, from two to three on on its own. Uh, I'm going to forbid it because if you allow that, you end up having an ordinary metal. So you want to turn it off. And that's really all you have to do. Just turn single hopping uh, off and then allow for uh, pairwise hopping from anywhere to anywhere. So I have to give you a set of, of order n to the power four numbers. Um, and when you have those numbers, then you can just put it on a computer and solve it. Well, except you can't uh, because it's too complicated uh, beyond say about 25 particles. Uh, even in the world's best computers, you cannot solve it. Uh, because the number of states is too large. So if you add 100 particles, roughly speaking, the number of states here is two to the power 100 because each side could be empty or full. Um, and two to the power 100 is a ridiculously large number. You, can, you, know, you can't store, <laughs> there's no computer uh, with that larger memory. So you simply cannot solve this problem beyond even 25 uh, on, any, on any computer. So, so, so our hopes of describing the entanglement of these electrons as they're hopping pairwise is kind of completely dashed. Well, not quite. So what uh, I argued in way back in 93 is that there's a huge simplification that appears uh, if we just assume that these numbers are uh, uncorrected random numbers. So each number is just some number uh, and uh, and we assume they're drawn from some distribution 
and and they are independent of each other. They're basically independent numbers. There's no correlation between them. Uh, this is not to say that I am studying an ensemble of systems. I'm just studying one system. I have just one system, and I want to describe the properties. I, all I'm going to require uh, is that the system be big, and there be no correlations between the different numbers. So once you assume that, it's kind of like a you know generic assumption in the study of random systems. Uh, then actually you can solve it. Uh, you can basically work out a lot of the properties of the system. Uh, and what you find, uh, remarkably, in this case, you can prove it for model. You get a metal in which the electrons move uh, not one by one, but in an entangled soup. They're always entangled with each other. They don't, you know, they're not able to liberate, separate each other from the rest of them. Rest of them. They're not paired up. They're really entangled in a way that gives you some basic idea of what's going on in a strange metal. Okay, uh, and so this is not just words, you can actually compute some things. So let's compute, uh, you know, uh, the most important thing, certainly for black holes, which is uh, if you want to know the entropy, we need to know the density of states. So here's uh, some numerical calculation for a small system of the density of states, you, you find all the energies, allowed energies for the system, which depend on all the use, uh, and then you bin them to figure out how many states there are per unit energy interval. Uh, and this result agrees very well uh, with the theory. So the theory tells us that if the system is large enough, uh, the envelope, so this curve becomes smoother and smoother as you make the system larger and larger. Uh, and so it has the same value for any system. And this is the smoothed out density of states. Uh, and it depends on the number of electrons, uh, the, the number of sites, and uh, some energy scale gamma, and the energy that's going in, of course, that's uh, just a function of that. And this number S0 uh, is, is, you know, what we computed in, 19, uh, 2000, this is the number, okay. All right, so uh, yeah, so in fact, yeah, that was done in 2001 with Antoine, George, and uh, Olivier Parcolet. Uh, the cinch only appeared recently and it came from computations in quantum gravity. And I'll tell you why quantum gravity is important in a minute. Uh, and the one over N was obtained and work with a group uh, you know, along with uh, Alexei Kitev. Anyway, so it took a while to build this answer, but it's a very definite clean answer for the density of states of the NSYK model. All right, uh, is there a question? Okay, the question is, uh, is this a lattice model or a non-lattice model? Uh, you're right, so it's, it's a non-lattice model, so I can't yet apply this to the cuprates where the electrons are definitely sitting on square, uh, uh, on a square lattice. Uh, here, in some sense, it's a model where there's no sense of space. So it's not, there's no sense in which, say, the site two is close to the site three, because it has an equal electron sitting on site two is equally likely to go to three as it is likely to go to 18 or 14. So, the whole system is really, it's really a point. It's, it doesn't have any space at all. It's like a zero dimensional dot uh, with lots of degrees of freedom all coupled to each other. Yes, to, so, but that's a very far cry from the situation in the cuprates. Uh, and why should this be of relevance to the cuprates? Yeah, well, <laughs> the, this particular model was uh, uh, motivated by the cuprate problem and you know, and proposed by us in 93. And at that time I was said, okay, this problem is really difficult. Let me just cook up any model I can think of, which can get rid of individual particle motion and only have cooperative motion in a strange metal like state. Uh, and that's what we came up with. Uh, but the question of why this is very relevant to the cuprates is something we've got repeatedly gotten since 1992. Uh, Presumably, it's also why nobody paid much attention to this model for the longest time. Anyway, but now a lot of progress has been made, uh, and uh, we think we can really extend some of these insights to a much more realistic model. Uh, but I don't think I have time to go into that. 
that okay all right so i've told you about all of this yes but where the connection you know to my you know certainly if you told me this in 19 uh, 93 that the SYK model is going to read to a theory of black holes, I would have said you're crazy. Uh, but that's what it did. Uh, and this was something that uh, slowly became clear over the years. And in fact, it was in 2010 that I first proposed that actually there was a deep connection between SYK model um, and charged black holes. So why does this connection arise? Well, to understand this connection, I needed to learn a little more general relativity, uh, which I learned over the years, uh, especially uh, from a group of Hong Liu and uh, John McGreevy, a paper of theirs that taught me a lot. Uh, so let's go back to general relativity and look at the solutions of Einstein's equation uh, for, a, for a black hole, which has a mass M, but also a net charge Q. Okay, so there's a mass M and charge Q inside the black hole. So since there's a charge, I have to put in electric fields. And since everything's relativistic, I also have to put in magnetic fields. So really, I have to look at the combined equations, you know, the two most famous equations from the 19th century or earlier 20th century, which is Maxwell's equations and Einstein's equations for electromagnetism and gravity and combine them together. Well, it turns out that there is a solution of a black hole with a net charge uh, called a reisner nordstrom black hole. And if you look at the solution of those equations, uh, you find something quite unusual and remarkable, which is as you go nearer and nearer the horizon, uh, if you are falling into this black hole, you will think your world is one, one, one dimensional. You'll have kind of tunnel vision and you'll only see the forward direction. Uh, and all of the angular degrees of freedom uh, would disappear, would be, in fact, they become rather high energy. So if you want the low energy or low temperature behavior of this black hole, um, you can just work in one space and one time dimensions. Um, so so if we, going back to this picture of entangled pairs, uh, we need only consider entangled pairs at this one point status of H, uh, because roughly speaking, you know, all the angular modes disappear and, and basically you're only looking at the so-called angular momentum zero mode, uh, which, uh, you know, which is just described by the dynamics of a single point in this direction, which is zeta sub H. Okay. Uh, so you only need entanglement uh, at a single point uh, in this two-dimensional space-time, which is zeta and tau. Well, I just told you about a model uh, with entanglement at one point, and that's the SYK model, uh, which is just, as I just discussed, it's just entanglement at a single point. All right, so, okay, so I have two systems which seem to involve intense, intense entanglement at a single space-time point. One, a charged black hole, and the other is the SYK model. All right, uh, but the amazing thing is the systems are the same. So this has now been proven that if you start, you, there's two ways to start. And I, you know, I have various review articles where both ways are described, but I won't be, have time to describe that here. You could start from the electrons hopping randomly in pairs uh, on the S on that on that dot, and then you can just write down, you know, Schrodinger's equation and look at. Uh, it's really the Feynman path integral that you look at at very low energies, you get some set of equations. The other route you can take is you can start from Maxwell's equation and Einstein's equations. Um, you put in a little bit of quantum mechanics. That's all very complicated, but then you reduce them down to uh, essentially this one space uh, and one time dimension. And then you find, lo and behold, you get the same equations. You get the same theory of quantum gravity uh, describing the, this near horizon region of a charged black hole um, as you get for uh, the SYK model. So this seems like magic, but it really has been essentially proven uh, and it relies on certain conformal symmetries of the two systems, if you know what that is, uh, but that's the main result. Okay. 
uh, yeah, quite, now looking at the questions. So there's a question, the black hole charge and only a negative charge. Yeah, so it has a net charge, it could be negative or positive, uh, which is why you know such black holes are probably not out there in our universe because every astrophysical ob uh, body is definitely charge neutral because uh, electrical forces are so, so much stronger than gravitational forces. So, you know, since the universe is net neutral, uh, every astrophysical object is neutral. So this, so this solution doesn't really apply to black holes out there, although these are possible systems that could exist uh, in our, you know, from what we know about uh, the, you know, the equation that govern our universe. Um, the neutral black holes, which is probably what all black holes are, uh, are much harder. And then no one has a theory of at this level of detail for the density of states of a new black hole. Okay, is there any reason why the particles are not tackled more than two at a time? Uh, no, you can also take generalized models where you entangle the particles Q at a time. And those are sometimes called SYKQ. Uh, it's just that. Uh, uh, two is the smallest number. It's two is the simplest case. And if you're entangling them four at a time or six at a time and so on, uh, or you know, two at a time, three at a time, four at a time, and so on, uh, you get the same theory. So the parameters are slightly different, uh, but you will get, it will still be true that these there's a universal set of equations that describe the charged black hole and also describe uh, entanglement in SYKQ. Okay. All right. So, so since they're the same equation, can we now figure out the density of states? And indeed, you can. So I, I gave you this formula earlier for the density of states of, uh, of the SYK model. And now there's a corresponding formula with, with these three factors. So just remember the three factors. There's a uh, Brief factor here, there's an exponential and there's a cinch of square root of energy. The energy dependence is only in the cinch, uh, which is right here. Okay, so it turns out that's the answer for a generic charged black hole, charge Q and the area of the horizon is related to Q by this formula. And this is it. So, so what are the different factors here? Well, the exponential factor is one I've already began the whole discussion with. That's the Bekenstein result, uh, Hawking result. Bekenstein had all of this except the factor of one quarter. The one quarter was obtained by Hawking. Well, that's of course crucial. Uh, so that's the exponential factor, similar to this exponential S naught. In this case, S naught is a pure number that came from certain next. Then there's a cinch, which is exactly the same, cinch of square root of energy. Uh, and that's because the low energy theory is really the same at some basic level. Uh, and this is another thing where you got H bar and G coming in, <laughs> but now it's H bar squared times G. And it gives you the density of states. Uh, and there's an overall prefactor. This is by far the most subtle thing. Well, I don't know by far. This is more complicated and really, it requires you to know what are the massless, you know, requires you to know something about a universe. It's not something you can get from the SYK model. Uh, and, uh, but it's just a overall prefactor, uh, which depends weakly on the area. The dominant terms are here, and both the dependence on the area and the energy. And so, so up to that prefactor, that this density of states is also the density of states of a black hole. So we have an answer, a generic answer for the density of states of, of a charged black hole. Oh yeah, I should also tell you that, yeah, this came from understanding the ASYK model and this was uh, obtained only recently by Luca Eliasu, uh, Samir Muthi and uh, Joaquin Toriachi. Uh, and, you know, I mentioned string theory, and here's in more detail. Now we understand much more detail what happens for supersymmetric black holes. Uh, and there you find, a, you know, all the degenerate states at low energy, and then the gap, and then something smooth. 
in contrast to the non-supersymmetric case where there is no such delta function and only a smooth density of states. All right, so this has been, you know, applied for many other properties of black holes, including black hole evaporation. Uh, and so that's been a very active field of research of, sorry, using this type of uh, theory of two-dimensional gravity to address all kinds of questions on of black holes. Uh, I've only talked about black holes in equilibrium, but there are also non-equilibrium questions that a lot of people have addressed. All right, so finally, I think I have one or two minutes. So the original problem that motivated all of this, which you're, you know, which we have, I worked on for over 25 years, is how do you get a theory of a strange metals? So in particular, how do you go from here to there? Uh, and we have, we think we have succeeded in a paper that's uh, about to be published. Uh, and this was work done over the years with my former student, Avishkar Patel, who's now at the Flydine Institute, my current student, uh, how you go, and a postdoc, Ilya Estelis. Uh, and so here we have to take a model which really knows something about uh, the, the square lattice and the cuprates and, you know, the spin liquid. Uh, but the common feature from the the... Uh, SYK model is that it's really crucial to assume that the couplings between the electrons, the interaction between the electrons, in particular interaction between an electron and some uh, bosonic particle would meet him, which allows them to entangle with each other. This coupling called a Yukawa coupling uh, must be spatially random. Uh, and there's many experimental reasons for it to be spatially random. There's always impurities in the crystal and so on. So you put in some spatially random G and you indeed get a resistivity that's linear in temperature. Uh, that's one of our main results. And there are many other properties we can compute and all as far as we can see are in good, uh, are consistent with the observations. All right, okay, another question. Uh, is are we only considering Schwarzschild black holes or other forms of L? In fact, I'm not considering Schwarzschild black holes at all. Uh, this black hole here is what's called a Reisner Nordstrom black hole. A Schwarzschild black hole is a neutral black hole. Okay, another question. What can be understood for an entangled player in black hole sense when we say SYK model uses Majorana fermions? How should we interpret the SYK Hamiltonian in general? Uh, great question. You, yeah, you can use Majorana fermions or complex fermions is the one that I've described. It doesn't matter. Uh, yeah, so, but really, I, I would, maybe the question is, is there really an SYK model in this in, inside a black hole? Uh, no, I don't think so. Uh, basically, the SYK model is, you should view it as a toy model of intense entanglement at a single spatial point. Uh, and that toy model has enabled her to understand certain universal features uh, of entanglement when it's sufficiently intense. Uh, and those universal features, you know, give you this exponential free factor and this cinch of squared of energy. Uh, by now, there are many other models, uh, most of them starting from gravity and some even starting from string theory. Which have which we now understand have the same universal features. So you know it's prob it's probably the case you know to really know what's inside a black hole we need to know what is the ultimate you know the theory of the ultimate high energies and it's probably string theory. So it's probably true that there you know you need inside here are strings is a is a better picture, but we are now talking about you know some. Uh, <laughs> Uh, some very, very subtle features. For most properties, when you're looking at the low energy dynamics, uh, you can go ahead and work with the uh, SYK model. It captures all the, you know, the important universal features that anybody has access to uh, at this point. Okay. Was it a goal to construct a model with conformal symmetry or was it emergent? Oh, these are great questions. <laughs> all of them. <laughs> uh, no, it wasn't a goal. It was a complete surprise when uh, you know, this random model turned out to be conformal. Nobody really expected it. Uh, although, you know, once we had the solution, that's one of the things that excited us made back already in, uh, in 
1993, although the full details of the conformal symmetry were not under, were understood first by George and Parkole in around 1999. Uh, is the randomness in hopping uh, between two points in the SYK model is the key for the high degree of entanglement? That's another great question. Uh, my answer would be no. I suspect there are non-random, in fact, there are a few non-random models which have the same degree of high entanglement. It's just that once you're non-random, it's much harder to solve. So, you know, this is one of those amazing things where if you take a random process, as long as you're looking at a sufficiently large system, uh, the solution becomes a lot easier. Uh, and uh, in, if that was the mental lock that certainly string theorists had to get over. Uh, so string theorists certainly don't believe their random couplings hanging out everywhere. And uh, I don't believe either. Uh, but if you're interested in certain basic general properties of entanglements, uh, then randomness is your friend because it can help you solve them very quickly. Um, I mean, there's, I can also make an analogy of, with another situation. I mean, if you if you start, for example, considered uh, say the quantum mechanics of a single electron uh, in a billiard. So a billiard is a you know two hemispheres with a straight in between them. So in a billiard, if a motion of an electron uh, in classically in a billiard is chaotic. Uh, and so now if you but if you solve Schrodinger equation in a billiard, then you get some set of energy levels, and they also seem like almost random numbers. Uh, they have some very specific distribution if you average over some energy interval, but they look kind of like random numbers. Now, if you look at the statistics of the spacing of the random numbers of these energy levels, you'll find that they're completely described by uh, the distribution uh, uh, of eigenvalues of a random matrix. So this was a you know, great discovery of Bohemian. Uh, they map the uh, energy level spacings of our quantum chaotic systems to the eigenvalues of a random matrix. Now, if you want to compute the correlation between the levels, uh, good luck trying to compute it by solving Schrodinger's equation in a billiards. That's a really hard problem. But it's relatively easy to compute all of that from a random matrix. Uh, and, uh, and now there's, you know, even today, there isn't a complete proof that the two distributions are the same but no one, everyone believes they are. There's a lot of numerical evidence. And I think there's almost a proof now in, in at least in some semi-classical limit, but not a proof uh, people tell me that the mathematicians are completely happy with yet. But physicists are perfectly satisfied. Uh, yeah, so, so, so that's the bottom line. Uh, you know, that, that, so there historically there was that famous example how quantum chaos is equivalent to random matrix theory. And now I'm saying that, you know, quantum many body chaos, at least for charged black holes, uh, is equivalent to the SYK model. It's at the same level, but now we're talking about many, you know, much more complicated systems with uh, many particle degrees of freedom. Okay. All right, so I'm going to end there. So let me just recap the basic message. Uh, so the SYK model describes multi-particle quantum entanglement resulting in the loss of identity of the particles. Uh, in one set of variables, it has helped us describe the strange metal properties of YVCO. Um, and in a dual set of variables, it actually describes the quantum, you know, at least the density of states of charged black holes. So, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, sir, for such an enlightening talk. Um, I'm sure a lot of people would be motivated to work in this area. Um, now we'll move on to questions. If uh, people have questions, they can unmute or maybe they can put them in the chat box. Hi, I have one question. Uh, yeah. So, um... I do not follow how the quantum entanglement across the horizon that leads to the area dependence in entropy. So could you explain that part? Um, 
Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, um, let's see, let me, oh yeah, I should share again. I mean, I haven't uh, shown you any calculations. There is a calculation that in some review article I'm finishing right now, but basically this is the picture. So we're imagining that, you know, there are, you know, there, you know, vacuum fluctuations that, you know, you have the, or, or in the, there's some matter, but the matter is way down here, but you're, you're thinking about the quantum mechanics of this region. Uh, quantum mechanically, uh, you know, there are, uh, say, pairs of electrons which are happen to be floating on and tangled, they're fluctuating. But if they are across a black hole horizon, then they'll be brutally separated from each other. And it's that brutal separation will lead to some kind of uh, uh, radiation coming outside. Uh, and that radiation implies this is some sort of black body. Okay, so that's a very crude picture. Uh, and so now you can, uh, so why should that uh, entanglement or the, why should the entropy be proportional to the area? Well, because the entropy is in, in precisely due to these EPR pair that are being separated from each other across the black hole horizon. Um, this, you know, this type of process happening out here, out here is not going to contribute an entropy. That's just uh, vacuum fluctuations, which are part of the ground state. But here, when you're doing, uh, uh, you know, when you're emitting radiation and separating EPR pairs, uh, then you're creating entropy. Okay, I hope I answered that okay. question. Any other questions? Uh, I had a question, uh, like since uh, we talked about random coupling, uh, uh, like has uh, has it, uh, has, have, has the uh, model be is being studied through the point of view of uh, out of time order correlator and oh. uh, like since uh, uh, like yeah that's the question yeah yeah absolutely I mean okay I didn't mention out of time co order correlators but in fact that was the, again uh, one of the big reasons that string theorists got really excited about the SYK model around 2015 uh, I had been excited since 92, and even I had pointed out the connection to uh, black holes in 2010, but nobody was paying attention. And I think one of the reasons suddenly everybody started paying attention uh, was this, uh, where was this? Okay, there was a, uh, uh, yeah, uh, was this uh, computation of the out of time order correlation function, which uh, for an SYK model of, I think it was done by Kitev, um, and uh, and he found this maximal transition to chaos. And then there was a paper by also around the same time by Stanford and uh, Steve Schenker, uh, where they did uh, computation of out of time order correlation in Einstein gravity, and both got the same answer. Again, that's another universal feature of intense many particle entanglement. Uh, the O talk has. Uh, maximal chaos, two pi kT over h bar is the pre, is the Lyapunov exponent, uh, and that appears in both the SYK model and in gravity, and so 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 that was uh, uh, you know that was one of the very much the motivation of the study and various explorations, uh, and you know of course now after the fact we understand it by the fact that they're obeying the same equations really, yeah. Yeah, so are there any further questions? Uh, I have, I a have one question. question. Oh, okay, sure. Yeah, uh, okay, so uh, the so, so so far what I understand this SIK model is that everything is connected to everything and uh, the hopping of the electron is uh, taken from a random distribution. Now, uh, instead of taking it from a random distribution, can we uh, put some quasi-periodic disorder, like something cosine and some irrational number times uh, the distance? I think you can. Uh, I, I think some of that has been studied. I mean, there are people who have also taken random dilution. You, I, I, you, could, take, you could take some quasi-periodic function or whatever. Yes, you can. Uh, the only important thing is that the 
they should be independent random variables. That is the probability of this hopping and probability that hopping should not be correlated. As long as they're independent random variables, it doesn't matter what you take. You know, it should, now there could be some, even some correlations in the sense that you could take a sparse SYK model and put in some correlations. Uh, it seems like not to matter. Now, on the other hand, you know, it's hard to prove these things because once you put in some correlations and you take your favorite distribution, nobody can solve it except numerically. <laughs> uh, yeah. so, but people have done it numerically and compared to the fully random case and you get essentially the same properties. Yeah. So. Okay. Thanks. Uh, so I have a big question, but... Uh... So like, as far as I understand these SYK and other tensor models, they have the, the same kind of behavior in this large and limited things are dominated by these melonic diagrams. And that gives to some universal kind of Green's function. So is it true that any model in principle, which has some charge black hole dual, as well as is a theory of some sort of a strange metal has to be some derivative of the SYK or there are other proposals as well? Well, okay. <laughs> I mean, but there's everything, you know, that's hard to predict, but the ones that are known so far are all basically melonic types with some variations. I mean, there's also the, the ones with mixed fermions and bosons, which are not exactly the melonic diagram, but closely they are the migdal Eliasberg diagrams. Uh, so I suspect the answer is yes, but I, you know, I don't know. And I don't know one's proven that somebody could find some other model, but what we, do expect uh, is that whatever model you find for it to have the physics of charged black holes, uh, that it has to have this uh, SL2 or symmetry, or there's a certain conformal symmetry that's uh, the symmetry of uniformly curved space uh, in one space in one time dimension. Uh, as long as the dynamics has this conformal symmetry, then it will be the same, basically. That's really all you need is the conformal symmetry. Okay, thank you. Mm, are there any more questions or comments? Yeah, one quick question, should we? So yeah. I was uh, thinking that is uh, all this, so SYK physics uh, is of this li linear T resistivity. So are this connected with also with the maximally chaos behavior and also this, um, this viscosity entropy ratio, like, can we expect that this will be all maximal yeah. in all such models? Uh, not that I know of. I mean, I should say, you know, SYK has maximum chaos, but the, the model that we're actually solving to get a strange metal is not, it's not XYK. It's, it's some, something that's been inspired by SYK. It's a little more, uh, more specific to the to two-dimensional physics. Uh, does it have, is, does that model have maximal chaos? Uh, in fact, it, 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 uh, uh, it almost does. There's some log correction, but it almost does, yes. <laughs> there, there will be a paper on that soon uh, that uh, some of my students are working on. Uh, then you asked about viscosity. Yeah, does this model have viscosity? In fact, it doesn't even have a viscosity because to define viscosity, you need translational symmetry. Otherwise, you can't even define. There's no conserved momentum, and you can't even define viscosity. So, at least for the strange metal, we believe it's essential that uh, you don't conserve momentum. And so, I seriously doubt the viscosity bounds will have anything to do with any observations. But it's also true for these lattice models, which are translation invariant, uh, right? In Yes, but so our claim in our recent work is that, uh, in fact, lattice models that are translated invariant do not have a strange metal. Now, so, so that's a prediction of our work. We, we've, we've also studied lattice models in great detail. And for example, the model where this coupling G is not spatially random. We've studied those models, you know, in great detail, and we are convinced that those models do not exhibit strange metal physics. So, so if someone found a perfect crystal, very, very clean crystal, which would look like a strange metal at low temperatures, well, then something would be wrong with that theory. But as far as I know, there's no such system out there. So we'll see. 
Uh, I'm sure people will try if they pay attention to the theory. Uh, but we are convinced that uh, spatial randomness is actually crucial for strange metal behavior. But those models also has linear T activity, right? Those lattice no, models. Don't. Which models? All these uh, lattice models you are talking about, or you? There are not. Do they? They have linear T resistivity at high temperatures in the in the okay. bad metal routine, where you're dominated by ohm cloud. But when you go to very low temperatures, all of those models, in fact, do not. They become essentially have a delta function and transport, and they become perfect metals, not strange metals. I see. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. Thank you for the very nice talk. Okay. Thank it you. It was very nice to have you here. And uh, yeah, definitely we wish to have you physically. Okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. Good. Okay. Thank you very much. Sir. Thank you very much. Yeah. yeah we would uh, love to have you here. Okay. Thank you. I, uh, yeah. Thank you for the great questions. I really enjoyed it. Yeah. They were very good. Okay. All right. I'll stop sharing.